Welcome. I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom. Good evening to everyone out there listening to WCATradio.com. My name is Robert Madrigal, the host of this show, Know Your Faith, a form for those who know the faith, a source for those who would like to get to know the faith, a.k.a. Unapologetically Apologetics. And on this show, we talk about Catholic apologetics, and we are unapologetic about our love for God, our love for Christ, and our love for the Catholic Church. On tonight's show, we're going to talk about the very Catholic practice of prayer to saints. We Catholics do pray to saints, We venerate them, and sometimes we even take up a saint to be our own personal patron. We follow their example. We learn from their lives. However, there are many misunderstandings about our practice, about this practice of praying to saints. And the misunderstanding is that we worship saints most of the time. I'd like to take that issue head on and explain different types of prayer. There is such a thing called intercessory prayer, which is very different from prayer of worship. But before we begin, I would like to start things off right with a a prayer. (laughs) So we'll begin our prayer in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, we come to you in great thanksgiving this evening for this opportunity to come together as brothers and sisters in Christ for the sake of defending the faith. We ask that you grant us the strength to explain and defend our faith with patience and charity. (laughs) Excuse me. And to see challenges to our faith as a chance to evangelize and to spread the love and peace of Christ to all whom we meet, and to do this through the example of self-sacrifice that Christ provides for us through his death on the cross. We ask this in the glorious name of Christ our Lord. Amen. And we'll end our prayer in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. So, like I said, Our subject tonight is the very Catholic practice of prayer to saints. And I remember when I was a kid growing up Catholic, I hadn't even ever given the thought and um, the issue a thought. I had never thought about prayer to saints. Then I met some mighty nice folks who invited me to their church services one day, and I got along with them really well, and they were a great group of people. So I started attending their church services regularly. Now, back then, they explained to me that it's wrong to pray to saints. And I was only 13 years old at the time. And I stopped going to Mass with my mom. And after a while, I felt that many of the practices that Catholics follow were wrong. I was about 38 when I came back to the church the Catholic Church. And it had been 25 years since I had heard all these anti-Catholic statements that were aimed at me while someone was trying to convert me over to the evangelical Christian movement. But after I came back to the church, it started up right away. It was within the first month after I came back to the Catholic Church when I ran into an ex-girlfriend of mine back when I was part of the evangelical church movement. And right off the bat, she began to attack our Catholic practices. But one of the things that she said to me that stands out in my memory is when she made the statement that Catholics worship 
saints. And I thought to myself 20 years ago the argument was against Catholic prayer to saints. I was always told Catholics shouldn't pray to saints. Now it's gotten a leg up and it's gone to Catholics worship saints. Now that's a big leap. (laughs) Even for 20 years. Now I've been back to the Catholic Church for the past 10 years and looking back I can see that it was that same conversation that got me into or interested in Catholic apologetics. See, the thing is, I didn't know what it was that she misunderstood about this Catholic tradition of praying to saints. And to be perfectly honest, I didn't understand the issue myself. But I had this feeling in my gut that there was more to it than what she had said. I remembered back when I was 13, I I knew there was only one God. So I knew that Catholics didn't worship saints. But I still couldn't understand what she was misunderstanding about the practice. But I did know in my heart that it was a misunderstanding on her part. So I investigated the reasons why we Catholics pray to saints. And I asked Father, you know, back in a back at a Holy Family, and I asked our deacon, his name is Deacon Santos, and after I had all my questions answered, uh, I was ready to convert my friend, my ex-girlfriend actually, to to the Catholic Church. But then I never saw her again. That's not a very great ending to my story, but that is how I got into Catholic apologetics. And I've been interested in the issues ever since, especially because I came across these challenges on a regular basis for the next couple of years. So I could I could say that it was this very same issue that we're going to talk about tonight, this topic of praying to saints that got me started in apologetics. And one thing that I've learned since then is that there is a big difference between the evangelical Christian movement and the original Protestant movement. Oh, there's many things that they have in common, of course, but they have more differences between them than the things they have in common. One thing I can say before we get into the meat and bones of this subject is that one of the differences between the original Protestant churches and the evangelical Christians that we see today is that the Protestants do show reverence for the saints, much like us Catholics do. For instance, they often name their parish churches after saints just like us Catholics do. And I was surprised when I found this out. And I remember that the first time I heard of such a thing, I was driving down this road called Paseo del Norte in Albuquerque. And there is a church that I passed by. And I had always just assumed it was a Catholic church. But I found out that day that it's an event, I'm sorry, excuse me, an Anglican church, which is one of the original Protestant churches. Now, the reason why I had always assumed that it was a Catholic church is because it is named St. Michael's. But on this particular day, I was driving by and there were some protesters out in front of the church. (laughs) Now, have you ever seen those carpenters union protesters that um, hold up a sign in front of a business when the business is, uh, any kind of business is involved in a construction of any sort and they're not using union labor. They'll set up a protest with a big sign in front of the location that says, you know, so-and-so, this this location is not using union labor. I'm sure everybody knows these folks, because I've seen them often. Well, when I saw their sign, it's a large sign, and I'm talking about, I noticed for the first time that this church in my story is an Anglican church and not a Catholic church because on that sign were big black letters, St. Michael's Anglican church is not using union labor. 
And I thought to myself, whoa, that's a Protestant church named after a saint. This is probably within the first year that I came back to the Catholic Church as I was still learning about, you know, the differences between Protestants and Christians and Protestants and Evangelicals. Well, I noticed that same day on the same road, Pasel del Norte in Albuquerque, I noticed the St. Luke's Lutheran Church. And those are the two original Protestant churches, by the way. And they're both, they both have churches named after a saint. And it really surprised me. I came, back, I came to find out that when talking about Protestants, there are many different beliefs when it comes to the saints. Now, I do not, and I will not claim to be an expert on what Protestants believe, because I'm not one. <clears throat> I never was a member of the Protestant, uh, any of the Protestant churches. I was an evangelical Christian. We used to call ourselves evangelical Christians, and I joined another church that called themselves born-again Christians, and another one that called themselves a Bible Christian church. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, but I had the chance to learn from a friend of mine who is a convert to the Catholic Church, and she grew up Lutheran in Ohio. She explained to me that there's what, what is called the high church and the low church. And in the internal structures of both the Lutheran and evangelical churches, there's the high church and the low church. The high church does almost everything that the Catholic church does, and at times even refer to themselves as Catholic light. I've heard that a, a few times. You know, like Diet Coke or something. Well, this really came to as a surprise to me, because before then, I had never met an Anglican or Lutheran who followed any of the practices that are considered Catholics, Catholic practices. All I had ever known before that were angry evangelical Christians. Now, I don't mean to offend anyone, but when I say angry, I don't mean to mock or attack the evangelical Christians, but the ones that I've met are the ones I'm referring to because it seems like I could literally feel the anger emitting from their voice as they spoke about the Catholic Church. Of course, I just want to make sure it's clear, I'm only speaking according to my own experiences. But come to find out that the original Protestant churches follow some of the same practices that we Catholics do, is the point. And I thought to myself, I wonder how deep this paradox has dug itself into the fabric of the Protestant movement. Well, one day I was visiting a relative of mine, my aunt, on my dad's side, who was a Baptist. And I had never even known my dad was a Baptist. And she had a refrigerate, a refrigerator magnet on her, on her refrigerator with an image of Our Lady of Guadalupe. And that kind of surprised me when I noticed it because I knew she was Baptist. So I asked her, I thought you were Baptist. She answered me, yeah, why? Well, I noticed that refrigerator magnet and uh, the Lady of Guadalupe. And all she said was, yeah, what about it? And um, it seemed like she didn't understand my confusion. So I said, didn't you say that it is wrong to pray to anyone but Christ? And she answered me, you mean other Baptists told you that? But I never did. I believe that we should show reverence for our Holy Mother. And this was a Baptist I was talking to. I was blown away when I heard that. So I asked her, are there many Baptists who feel that way? Are you an ex-Catholic or something? Well, when I asked her that, she told me that her dad, my grandfather, strictly forbade her and her siblings, including my father, to ever even enter a Catholic church. So... She was never Catholic. She explained to me that there are some Baptists who accept reverence for our Holy Mother, yet reject prayer to saints. And it all seemed, a, a, well, not just a bit confusing, but very confusing to me that at that time. Because like I said, all I had ever heard from were evangelical Christians 
who say that is a very big no-no. Prayer to saints or reverence for the Holy Mother, our Holy Mother. So I asked her, do you pray the Hail Mary? She explained to me that not only does she pray the Hail Mary, but there are also many Baptist churches whose pastors teach that they should show reverence to our Holy Mother and pray the Hail Mary. She also told me that this was a source of division among the Baptists. Then it came to mind. I had this picture in my mind of a few years back before that day when I was watching the news on TV and uh, there was this one time where there was there were these two Baptist churches who were lo- located directly across the street from one another. I can't remember the town, but it was in New Mexico, my home my home state, they were right across the street from one another and they had members who were feuding over some issues. And I asked her about it. I remembered that that incident and I asked her, uh, my aunt, if she knew about it. And she told me that not only did she hear about that same situation, but she has friends who are involved in that controversy. She explained to me that the feud was over the same issue we were talking about, prayer to saints. And that one side points out that half the prayer of the Hail Mary is in the Bible. As it is, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. The other side claims that the prayer to anyone, that prayer to anyone else but Jesus is wrong because the Bible also says that Jesus is the one and only mediator between God and man. Well, the point that I'm trying to make here is that there are many Protestants who follow Catholic uh, practices. Excuse me. Um, So what that means to me is that we can claim that most Christians follow these practices. And I say that because the fact of the matter is that the Catholic Church alone represents most Christians. There are more Christ, more Catholics in this world than all the other Christian denominations, so-called denominations, um, than all of them put together. <coughs> oh, excuse me. And that's including the Orthodox churches of the East and even Western Orthodox churches. So even if we didn't count the Protestants and Baptists who are Catholic at heart, we would be able to make this claim that most Catholics follow Catholic, I'm sorry, excuse me, most Christians follow Catholic practices. However, using this approach is not always the answer. Saying that, you know, you have to, a lot of people think that you'll be saying that we have to follow the crowd. And the objection would come up that not, um, that following the crowd is not always right. But what we are talking about here is prayer to saints, and sometimes people believe that Catholics are wrong to pray to saints, and at other times, people even believe that Catholics worship saints. Well, one of the things that we should do to clear up the confusion between prayer and worship, and um, I'm sorry, excuse me, I'm trying to say one of the things that we should do is to clear up the confusion between prayer and worship. Now, there is prayer of worship, to be sure, but there is also other types of prayer, which are separate and apart from prayer of worship. So, when someone objects to prayer to saints or makes the claim that Catholics worship saints, the approach that I always use is to simply ask, do you believe that there are different types of prayer? And if the answer is yes, then that makes my task a bit clearer and easier. But when the answer is no, then I go on, oh, excuse me, to ask, I go on to ask if the person has ever said a prayer of thanksgiving. Now, a prayer of thanksgiving is close in nature to a prayer of worship, but (laughs) it isn't meant to recognize God as our deity, but it is meant to thank God for his many blessings. 
This is very distinct from a prayer to acknowledge that God is the divine creator, which is prayer of worship, divine worship. And there are other types of prayer as well. Have you ever said a prayer for a family member or a friend? This is something I always ask anyone who objects to uh, prayer to saints. Now, I've never met a Christian who objects to prayer for one another. Most Christians believe that we should pray for each other. And this is what the church, the Catholic Church, calls intercessory prayer. When we pray for one another, we intercede for one another. And every Christian, Catholic or otherwise, that I have met does this. There's also petition prayer. And that's when we ask for specific blessing in our lives. This is a whole other type of prayer. So I go through all that so that I can make the point that there are different types of prayer, of course. Prayer of thanksgiving, divine worship, intercessory prayer, etc., etc. However, when explaining this to a person who believes in the Bible alone doctrine, we may need to establish a biblical basis for our argument. (laughs) So let's go ahead and uh, look at a couple of verses that we could show the different types of verses. There are, there is, excuse me, what we read in Paul's first letter to St. Timothy. And that's in, that's found in chapter 2, verse 1. I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, and thanksgiving be made for all people. I'll just repeat that one more time. Petitions, prayers, and thanksgiving be made for all people. Right there in the pages of the Bible, it lists three different types of prayer and just one verse. Additionally, we can see that intercessory prayer is mentioned in the Bible. Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 15, verse 30. Join me in your prayers to God on my behalf. That sounds just a little confusing, so let me read it again. Join me in your prayers to God on my behalf. Now, this is literally asking for intercessory prayer. Paul is asking the leaders of the church in Rome to pray for him. (laughs) Your prayers on my behalf. Okay, now we'll go into Colossians 4.3 and Thessalonians 5.25. Both of them mention prayer, I'm sorry, excuse me, Both of them mention pray for us. And that is asking, that is also asking for intercessory prayer as well. Those are Bible verses which mention mention intercessory prayer for each other. And that is our argument that we should pray for each other. But I also explain that this I also explain all this so that I could establish common ground, not just make the point. Because most Bible Christians will agree that intercessory prayer for one another is acceptable. But then what I do is I have to explain when we Catholics pray to saints, we're not asking for forgiveness. We're not worshiping saints as gods. We're not acknowledging their deity at all. Or even... um, in imagining their deity, uh, we are asking them to intercede for us and pray for us on our behalf, just like we do for each other here on earth. That's something that I find very important because that is the that is the essence of their misunderstanding of prayer to saints. But then it's a good idea to give them an example of intercessory prayer that we ask for saints, from saints and to show them the difference between the two, between 
asking for intercessory for prayer from a saint and the worship of God. Let's look at the litany of saints. I'm sure most of us Catholics have heard that prayer. Uh, during Mass, especially during Easter time, we begin the prayer with, Lord, have mercy on us. Christ, have mercy on us. Now that part of the prayer is directed towards Jesus and towards God. Then we go into the intercessory prayer part of it, and it's very distinct. The, the distinctions are very clear. We start to pray, St. Michael, pray for us. St. Gabriel, pray for us. St. Raphael, pray for us, etc., etc. This shows that intercessory prayer to a saint is very different from prayer for mercy from Jesus Christ, all in one prayer. Now, the problem is that even though we take our time to explain all this, there is the common obje objection that you might come across. I've always come across people who might who always state that's different. We could pray for each other, but praying to saints is praying to dead people, and dead people can't hear you. Now, the first thing that comes out of my mouth, the first thing I like to say is that, do you think that to be impossible? Because personally, I believe that everything is possible with God. That sometimes gets me in trouble because it sounds um, like I'm being smart. Smart I'll talk about it, but... Um, <coughs> Personally, I have to. I also have to mention that personally, I can't buy into thinking of Christians of the past as just dead people. Now that might sound really crazy, but I do have a good reason to make that statement. That's another thing that we could read in the Bible: that us Christians form a communion, and the Catholic Church calls it the communion of saints. This is another teaching from the Catechism, which is found written in the pages of Scripture, or in other words, um, the Bible. The communion of saints is taught by the Catholic Church, and we can find a description of it in the Bible. Now, this description that I'm talking about is found in the Gospel of John, chapter 15, verse 5, where Jesus says, I am the, va the vine, excuse me, I am the vine, and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Depart from me and you, will, and you can do nothing. Now as Christians, when we die, we have to ask our Protestant brothers and sisters or our evangelical Christian brothers and sisters, is as Christians, when we die, do we depart from Christ? Now the Catholic Church teaches that we do not depart from Christ but we become a more intricate part of the branches. We become closer to Christ in death than we can ever be with him here in life. Now that is why Christ came down to earth, to save us from our sins, was it not? And to be with him in heaven when we die. <clears throat> Yet, the only way we know him on earth is through the church. Well, I really have to con confess here that I have yet to convince anyone of the validity of this argument, as my opponents have always changed the subject, or sometimes they'll bring up a different objection, like calling priest father, or the scandals in the church, or they'll bring up a tougher subject, like uh, Hitler was Catholic and all this other stuff. So I have yet to convince anyone using this um, verse in Scripture. But there are other verses in the Bible which show prayer to saints as being perfectly acceptable. But before we get into all that, I'd like to mention that most people do not understand what it means to be a saint. I usually ask an opponent if he or she would be able to explain to me what a saint is. And the usual answer that I get is it is the Catholic Church's way of making a list of people that they call saints and believe that that person went to heaven after they died. Well, that is a small part of what the Catholic Church teaches on sainthood. So then I'll ask, did you know that both you and I 
are saints, are also saints according to the Catholic Church? Yes, the Catholic Church teaches us that the communion of saints is made up of three parts. The Church triumphant, those are the saints in heaven. The Church suffering, and those are the saints in purgatory. And the Church militant, those are the saints who still live here on earth. Militant meaning we march here on earth, we're wa walking on earth. <clears throat> now be very careful though, because this will always be sure to bring up a uh, the issue of purgatory, and all, I always answer that with, I would like to deal with one issue at a time, please. But I believe that explaining the communion of saints helps people realize that there is much more to the issue than that what they are aware of. That might help weaken their stance on the issue. And also it helps to point out that the communion of saints sounds a lot like the parable of the vine and the branches. But then they always go back to the so-called dead people who most um, Bible Christians claim can't hear us. Well, let's go ahead and look at what the Bible has to say on that issue. When we read the Gospel of Mark, chapter 12, verses 26 through 27, we can see that, and it says that God, he is the God of the living, not of the dead. He is the God of the living, not of the dead. So when a Christian dies and goes to heaven, they're not just dead. Okay, now in the same gospel, the gospel of Mark, chapter 9, verse 4, And there appeared unto them Elijah and Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. Now, this Apparition happened right in front of the apostles, and Jesus communicates with the two, with two of the dead prophets from the Old Testament. So, when they died, they were closer to Jesus than they had ever been in life. I mean, wouldn't you say? Okay, so the next verse that I want to look at comes from the Gospel of Luke. And this is the strongest verse that we have um, that we could use to make the case for intercessory prayer imparted by dead people who cannot hear us, according to uh, Bible Christians. We're going to take a look at the Gospel of Luke, chapter 16, verses 19 through 28. And in the interests of time, I will just read um, from verses 27 and 28. <clears throat> You would have to study this entire chapter, basically, to learn more about it. But this is where the departed dead man intercedes for his brothers. A departed dead man actually intercedes for his brothers. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers that he may testify unto them, lest they also come to this place of torment. <clears throat> now, this, that last um, part of that sentence is the most important. Lest they also come to this place of torment. What we're talking about here is the rich man who suffered and prayed for Father Abraham to send Lazarus to go to his father's house and warn his five brothers so that they would avoid joining him in the place of suffering. And what we have here is intercessory prayer for the living imparted by a dead man who, according to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 16, verse 22, had died and was buried. <laughs> I don't see anything getting any more clear than that on this issue. A man who had died imparting prayer for the living. Okay, so with that, I just want to make one really quick note on purgatory, even though that's not the topic of the show. When we read these verses, these same verses of the rich man's suffering, and um, the translation 
from the King James Version of the Bible might sometimes lead us to believe that the rich man is suffering in hell. But you have to point out that just the fact that he was able to communicate with Father Abraham, and since, excuse me, he could intercede for his brothers tells us that he was suffering in purgatory, because souls suffering in hell are cut off from the presence of God, and the saints triumphant in heaven. And the saints triumphant in heaven are in the presence of God. So, um, if the person that you're talking to insists that what we're talking about in those verses is how you could point that out. So there you have it, a good ba biblically based argument for the very Catholic practice of prayer to saints. Now I just want to take a quick look to see how reasonable it is to pray to saints. The saints are Christians who came before us and dedicated, dedicated their lives to God and the church. Some of them are very amazing saints and sisters who are newly newly ordained, I'm sorry, excuse me, newly canonized. And one good example of that is Saint Madre Teresa. And even though there's been some controversies about her life, we have to acknowledge that she did some great works. And she accomplished a lot during her lifetime. Other saints are very amazing priests who gave us some of the greatest works of the church and the greatest theological works in the history of mankind within or outside of the church. <clears throat> Saints Augustine and St. Thomas Aquinas are great examples of those. Then we have child saints. And this should really show us Catholics a great respect for saints. Not just the ones I've just mentioned, but this next child saint who I'm going to mention, anyone who does not respect San Jose Sanchez del Rio has to be on the wrong side of the issue because he was only 14 when he refused to renounce Christ. Even after enduring brutal torture and humiliation at the hands of the Mexican government at the age of 14. Now, I'm 49 years old right now, and even though I hope I'd never have to endure the suffering that San Jose Sanchez del Rio was made to bear, I hope that I would show the same courage that he did if I ever had come under such duress. In the 2,000-year history of the church, we have proven to be a saint-producing machine San Jose Sanchez de Rio is just one example of that. A friend of mine back in Albuquerque used to call our church a saint-producing machine. Now, what is wrong with looking up to somebody so that we could have an example in life? There's nothing wrong with that. That's a big part of choosing a patron saint. And a lot of people do that here on earth during their lifetimes, and they do that with earthly examples, not saintly ones. A good friend of mine back in Albuquerque, Deacon Pablo Lafarbe, put it best during one of his homilies. It was during a daily mass. I believe it was on a Wednesday. He was uh, talking about saints and uh, the way he put it, a saint is someone we can look up to and pattern our lives after. Secular people do it all the time. For instance, when a young man gets into basketball, who would he find inspiration from? The basketball greats who came before him, that's who. Men like Michael Jackson, I'm sorry, Michael Jackson, excuse me, Michael Jordan and Magic Johnson. A painter gets their inspiration from Picasso and Rembrandt. We find our inspiration in people like St. Joseph the stepfather to, to Jesus Christ, who put Jesus and Mary ahead of himself in all things and sometimes even went without eating because of his selflessness. What is wrong with putting our reverence towards 
a saint like him. All the martyrs who gave their lives for Christ, and tur instead of turning their backs on him, and there have been many. I could go on and on, but the point is that saints have done the work necessary and kept the faith, excuse me, kept the faith alive for the past 2,000 years now. It is our turn to keep the faith alive for the church militant of the future. And that's how communion works. That is how we are saved in communion, not just individually. And to recognize the saints is to recognize this point. Well, with that, I'd like to end tonight's show with a presentation on a very amazing saint. And his name is St. Ignatius of Antioch. I've only got around 13 minutes left, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, make this presentation that I, I wrote for a class back at Holy Apostles, and I had to edit it for radio, so please bear with me. This was a, <clears throat> this was a presentation on a saint for a class on apologetics. So one of the main points I would like to make is that when we think of saints, we must realize that we are truly saved in communion. The love of Jesus Christ transcends time, culture, and even geographical areas. Excuse me, geographic areas. Jesus Christ is my personal Lord and Savior, but more importantly, He is our Lord and Savior, past, present, and future. The saints show us that the Christians of the past kept the important work of salvation going for our salvation to this day. We must in turn keep the work going for the saints of the future. The saints also show us that the work of salvation did not end with the death of the last apostle. Instead, that was only the beginning. A good example is St. Augustine, who wasn't even born until the 6th century. Yet his writing is highly regarded as one of the most important works of theology in the history of mankind and the Catholic Church. Next, to Scripture, of course. If you would read the Summa, it wouldn't take long to figure out why St. Thomas Aquinas is the next saint to come to mind. But right now I would like to tell you about an early first century saint. I'm sorry, excuse me. He's a second century saint. That's a mistake I made. I'm going to tell you about an early second century saint named St. Ignatius of Antioch. But right now I'd like to begin with a question. How many of our listeners out there have ever heard of St. Ignatius of Antioch? And of those of us who have heard of him, how many of us know of St. Ignatius's many claims to fame. Well, I'm always surprised to find out how many people that I talk to in person, even devout Catholics, have never heard of St. Ignatius. And I hope by the time that I'm finished with this presentation, you will wonder the same thing. Well, since there is so much to say about St. Ignatius, I will start from when he was a child. I will tell you about the Catholic tradition that will tell us who he is, who St. Ignatius really is. And I will tell you about the important work that he took part in during the early church. I will tell you about his glorious martyrdom and finally how he took time during his last days before his martyrdom to give the church the church's teaching on the Eucharist and even give, gives us the earliest known documents that show that our Holy Mother Church was known as the Catholic Church way back in the second century. Now, as an apologist, when it comes down to choosing a saint to do a presentation on, the choice for me was clear. It was hand, hands down St. Ignatius of Antioch. And that's because the Protestants and Evangelical Christians teach the Bible alone doctrine. Now, I know that everyone out there listening knows that the Bible alone doctrine contrasts with our Catholic Bible plus tradition. 
So St. Ignatius gives us a good example of the importance of tradition because we can find him in the pages of the Bible even though it does not mention him by name. We know that through tradition and tradition alone, where we can find St. Ignatius in the Bible. Catholic tradition tells us that St. Ignatius was the child mentioned in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 18, verses 2 through 4. As I read, after the disciples asked our Lord, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called over a child, placed it in their midst and said, Amen, I say to you, unless you become like children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Whomsoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. End quote. Now it is from Catholic tradition that tells us that St. Ignatius is the one that Jesus referred to as this child from those verses. But that's just one example of Catholic tradition that we could also find in the Bible. There is also a second tradition that tells us about St. Ignatius, and it, is also, it also appears in Scripture. It tells us that St. Ignatius was a child among the people present at the multiplication, excuse me, multiplication of the loaves. Finally got that out. <laughs> As we read in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 14, verses 20 through 21. And they all ate and were satisfied. And they picked up the fragments left over, twelve with wicker baskets full. Those who ate were about five thousand, five thousand men, not counting women and children. End quote. Now, I just want to point out that if any every man present that day represents a family, then that can mean we could we're talking about upwards of fifteen to twenty thousand people there. And if every family had just one child, we're talking about 5,000 children. Some families might have had more than one. Tradition, Catholic tradition, tells us that St. Ignatius was one of those children. Now, as a Catholic apologist, I feel that these two examples of Catholic tradition are very important. Not because they would be useful in a debate with the Protestant, but because it helps give the everyday Catholic a good idea of what Catholic tradition can tell us. Hopefully these bits of information will plant seeds in the minds of the average layperson that can blossom and grow and give us the inclination to learn more about Catholic tradition. And on that note, I'd like to move on to St. Ignatius's time as, his, excuse me, as Bishop of Antioch. And due to time restraints, I would like to move quickly through this accompli his accomplishments as bishop so that I could spend more time on the story of his epistles. Early biographies on St. Ignatius tells us that Ignatius grew up from childhood in the faith and went on as a young man and tra traveled with both Saints Peter and Paul, Peter and Paul, excuse me, before finally ending up a disciple of St. John in Antioch. We go on to learn that St. Ignatius served as the third bishop of Antioch, where he served as bishop for 40 years, which alone is a great accomplishment. But just one side note, as a bishop, I'm sorry, excuse me, as a disciple of St. John, he took part in the conversion of another great noteworthy saint, St. Polycarp. From these early biographies on St. Ignatius, we know one thing about him, and that, that is that he is one of the most important interme intermediary links between the Catholic Church and the patristic era. Excuse me, the apostolic church and the patristic era. That might be due in part to two important facts. Number one, Antioch was the city, as the city is very important to the Roman Empire at the time, and number two, and most importantly, Antioch was one of the first and most important Christian communities of the early church. As we see it stated here in Acts, 
chapter 11, verse 26. For a whole year they met with the church and taught a large number of people. And it was in Antioch where the disciples were first called Christians. Well, at this point, even though there is much to tell about his time as bishop, I would like to move on and talk about the time before his martyrdom and the epistles that he wrote on the road to Rome. It is very important to point out that the, just the fact that he was martyred can tell us at least one glaring fact. He caught the attention of the Roman authorities. Now, back in the days of Rome, the Romans did not worry too much about the average layperson nor would they spend too much time looking for priests or bishops who weren't making a lot of noise, so to speak. So he must have caught the attention of the, authority, of the authorities in one of three different ways. Number one, he did something publicly to catch their attention. Number two, he, betrayed the her he was betrayed by heretics. Or number three, and this is my favorite, his renown alone made him a target. So he was arrested, interrogated, and condemned in Antioch but he was taken to Rome for execution. Now, it was on his way to Rome that he gave us his most important and noteworthy works in the form of letters that he wrote during this time. These letters have come to be known as the Epistles of St. Ignatius of Antioch. In the epistles, we can find a full list of useful information. And if the facts that we've covered so far aren't enough to make Saint to make Saint Ignatius, a very noteworthy saint, we gain insight into the church's teaching that contradicts what both atheists and Protestants alike believe on a few different topics. In the epistles of Saint Ignatius, he writes into one of them that there is a connection between the Eucharist and the sacrifice of the martyrdom. He wrote to many churches on the way to Rome and he urged them not to intervene to the emperor on, be, on his behalf, so that the, he may sacrifice himself for Christ, just as Christ sacrificed himself for us. Well, I'll go ahead and read it from the text, because St. Ignatius put it so much more eloquently than I can. I am the wheat of God. Let me gr be ground by the teeth of the wild beasts, that I may be found to be pure bread of Christ. And that comes from the um, St. Ignatius of Antioch in the year 110 AD. Now, I think that there is much to be said about this quote. First, with the Old, Te Old Testament teaching that the animal sacrifice must be consumed and the reference to the bread of Christ. I can even say that this, the verse in this epistle is very difficult to interpret. But what I can understand from it is a connection to the Eucharist. That it is a sacrifice that we continue giving. St. Ignatius went on to give us many references to many teachings of the church. And he wrote about the heresies of, of the time. But the most notable item for an apologist such as myself is the reference to the church as the Catholic church that he wrote about. And I'll go ahead and read it from the, his epistle. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm getting a little tongue-tied here. But I'm going to go ahead, ahead and read from his epistle from the church, or addressed to the church of Smyrna. Where the bishop is, let the multitude of the believers be. Even as where Jesus is, there is the Catholic Church. Now, this epistle goes all the way back to the year 110 A.D. One big reason why I point this out is because atheists and Protestants alike believe that the Catholic Church was created by the Emperor Constantine in the year 325 during the Council of Nicaea. Now, even though this information will never convince an atheist, I like for Catholics to know this and have it under their belt. Because that is the first written reference to the Catholic Church in the history of mankind. So with that, I'd have to say good night because I'm running out of time here and I'd like to I invite everyone listening to join us again in two weeks from now for a show on the topic of purgatory. 
does purgatory exist? Now, this is a, another topic which divides Protestants and Catholics, mainly Bible Christians and Catholics. So the next show is the third in our series where I will talk about misunderstood Catholic doctrines. And I'd like to say, I'd like to ask everyone to pray for fallen Catholics to return to the church, the church militant. For everyone out there listening to choose a saint from the church triumphant to be their own per personal patron and to live a saintly life as example from the saints. And finally, to pray the rosary for the church suffering. Always keep in mind what your favorite saint accomplished in their lifetime. So to everyone out there listening to WCAT Radio, I am looking forward to spending this time with each and every one of you out there who are interested in listening to what I have to say and to hear from you as well. Please email me at madrigal.robert at ymail.com. That is madrigal.robert at ymail.com. And you can find that on our website, wcatradio.com. Please feel free to email me with any questions you might have or, more importantly, comments. So let's go ahead and end our time together with a prayer. We we'll begin our prayer in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, we come to you in great thanksgiving this evening for this opportunity to come together as brothers and sisters in Christ so that we may learn more about our faith for the sake of defending the faith. We ask that you grant us the strength to explain and defend our faith with patience and charity and to see challenges to our faith as a chance to evangelize and to spread the love and peace of Christ to all whom we meet. And to do this through the example of self-sacrifice, Christ provides for us through his death on the cross. We ask this in the glorious name of Christ our Lord. Amen. And we'll end our prayer in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and good, say good night to everybody out there listening, and uh, may God be with you in all things and in everything you do. Good night. Hi there. This is Christine Mooney Flynn, host of the Catholic Mama podcast, and I'd like to invite you to join me over on the Catholic Mama. To develop a Christian family and raise children who are and who, God willing, will continue to be confident Catholics requires us as parents to be confident in our faith as well. So each week, I dive into topics that help to make sense of the Catholic faith and how to live out that faith in our vocation as husbands and wives, moms and dads. So whether you need help in explaining aspects of Catholic doctrine, like the real presence in the Eucharist, or if you're looking for practical ideas on how to live a more Catholic life, my goal is that you'll find the answers and guidance you're looking for over on my show, The Catholic Mama. I hope to see you there. We hope you enjoyed the program and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.